Thank you, Harry. Now we've got uh, a little letter that was written by Lou Lafferty for a news article before he had passed away. And he was the crew chief on this plane. So I thought it proper to read his story also. And Bob McCullen from our 417 is going to read that. It is Sunday, January 10th, 1945. World War II is boiling toward its climax in the South Pacific. The location is Hollandia, New Guinea. A Northrop P-61B Black Widow night fighter streaks down a runway carved from an, an emerald green jungle. As it becomes airborne, the plane makes two passes buzzing the airstrip. Then it heads for 7,000 feet. Mount Cyclops is at the end of this island. The pilot peels to the right, then to the left of the mountain. He makes a final attempt to clear it straight over the top. The plane stalls. He does not make it. There is a thunderous crash, then all is still. After 44 years in this gallant warrior of the skies has been resurrected and is coming home. Lewis Lafferty of Kennett Square tells the story. He was there at the beginning. Lafferty was assigned to the Air Force 550th Night Fighter Squadron a armored gunner, classification 911. He is in charge of the machine gun turret. The crew of the P-61B consisted of a pilot, gunner, and radar observer. The Black Widow was the most advanced night fighter plane in the U.S. Air Force at that time, Lafferty says. This particular plane, number 42-39445, had just been delivered to the 550th from the United States via Australia. It only had 11 hours of flying time logged on it. The crew there had flown it three hours and test fired it on strafing missions. It had never been indoctrinated into heavy combat. Lieutenant Logan Southfield, the pilot, met by chance a friend from his hometown in Michigan, Ruth Hillman, who was in the intelligence corps of the WACs. Southfield approached me and our crew chief, Glenn Shoemaker, stating that he would like to take a friend of his on a routine flight, strafing mission and whatever else ensued. A Lieutenant Lovelight also went along for the ride. The fourth member of the flight was Lieutenant Ben Goldstein, the radar observer. Lafferty and Shoemaker got into a jeep and went out to the runway to prepare the plane for flight. The two four-bladed props required two men to rotate them with their hands and shoulders to activate the oil in the cylinders. They pulled the blocks from the wheels. Lafferty and Shoemaker watched from their jeep as the plane took off and then came back to buzz the airstrip. It was so low they could feel the air off the props. Lafferty rec recounts seeing the aircraft crash into the mountain. It stalled like a big bird, he says. It lost airspeed and pancaked into the side of the mountain. We observed the dust, debris, and steam coming up. There was no smoke. It did not catch on fire. Within two hours, a rescue team was formed made up of five groups, eight men per group with officers and medical personnel. We proceeded to climb the mountain and were six to seven hours up when we had to halt because of darkness. We set up a bivouac. The officer in charge of each group instructed the men not to use any flashlights or flares to attract attention of the Japanese. The area was heavily infested with them and U.S. forces moving north had bypassed them, cutting their supply lines. They were desperate. After about one or two hours of climbing the next morning, we came to a 300 to 400 foot high cliff. Not being able to climb the sheer rock, we had to change our course. In doing so, it was decided by one of the officers to fire a flare. A green flare was fired in the general direction of the aircraft above us. Within minutes, there was a return white flare indicating life at the crash site. We continued on until we reached the plane. 
We found the WAC with hip and back injuries. Lieutenant Lovelei was injured. Goldstein had severe scalp wounds. Somehow, the pilot eluded us. He either descended the mountain during the night or took a different route from any of the rescue groups. We, we used makeshift stretchers made of branches and blankets to transport Hillman and Goldstein back down the mountain. There were 40 men altogether, alternating every 10 minutes in carrying the wounded over the rough terrain. It took 60 to 70 stitches to, to sew up Goldstein's scalp when we reached the base hospital. We met Southfield, who had come back for help, not knowing of the rescue effort. It was determined that Southfield lost the aircraft through overzealous flying. Lafferty and Goldstein were assigned to another aircraft, but did not see much action after that. At the reunion of Lafferty's old outfit held in Las Vegas in May of 1988, which he attended, it was voted to recover and restore the P-61B. The Mid-Atlantic Air Museum of Reading, Pennsylvania, famous for this type of work, is recovering and restoring the plane. After being buried for 44 years under 60 to 80 feet of growth, it was astounding to find the nose wheel tire still had air in it and there was fluid in the hydraulic system. The process is long and tedious. After disassembling the parts at the site, a helicopter landing pad had to be built to facilitate removal. Then parts had to be crated and shipped back to the United States. After restoration at Reading, the plane will be flown to air shows around the country, eventually to be displayed at the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio. Lafferty is proud to have been a night fighter. He said the P-61B was powered by two 2,500 horsepower Pratt & Whitney engines. The armament consisted of four rockets on each wing and four 20 millimeter cannon mounted on the fuselage under the wings, which were fired by the pilot. There were four 50 millimeter, 50 caliber machine guns in a turret behind the pilot. The plane could attain speeds in excess of 350 miles an hour, take off in 1,000 feet, and land at 70 to 80 miles per hour. Always flown at low altitude, the Black Widow was used for nighttime strafing or dusk attacks. It was also employed in taking pictures.